there's a high probability you say, well, no, well, what in the world could we do with the Teutonic plate shifting in the Pacific uh, rim of fire? And we don't have anything to do with that. Wait till you hear what he has to say. So we like to bring new and exciting thought to the airwaves, and we will today in our second segment with him. Our third segment deals with environmental issues. And again, not that we can change anything in the environment today, but we can sure make you aware of what's happening in the environment. For example, Ohio passed probably the worst gas fracking law in the country. And when I explain what they did, and then how did they do that? Why in the world would someone in the Ohio Senate or House pass a law that clearly would be against the citizens? So I'll share that with you as well. And then also, those of you who have been listening know that we were the first radio program in the United States to expose ALEC. And then we asked for a national boycott. We've asked a hundred times to boycott the group of corporations that have formed quietly, secretly, and then they go in once or twice a year. They meet with your state legislator. They give the state legislator laws and say, we want you to pass these laws. And there's only two ways that these laws impact us. One, they deregulate any form of uh, protective device that was there for us. And B, they allow corporations to maintain monopolistic practices or they make something mandatory. For example, in New Jersey or in New York State, mandatory vaccines with Gardasil. Why? Because we were told it will prevent cervical cancer and hence it becomes law. Then if you as a concerned and, and conscientious parent choose to say no, you could be arrested. Child services could take your child away. That's how much power they have. So since the public only looks at something that impacts them immediately today and doesn't look behind the scenes, we do. As an investigative journalist with over 600 articles and 300 original stories breaking on WBAI in New York, PFW in Washington, KPFK, our sister station in Los Angeles, where I've been for 34 years on Pacifica, and on Progressive Radio Network that I founded seven years ago, which is now the fastest growing radio network in the world. I mean, if you only saw how many people downloaded Monday night's Progressive Commentary Hour, it's more than all the other people on all the other stations combined. Now, how's that possible? Give people information that can empower them. But do not, do not ever stop and say, well, are these people the right color? Are they the right religion? Are they right economic? Are they the right political ideology? Are they left enough? Are they right enough? That is absolutely immaterial and will never play a part in what I share. And in my own way of believing, we all deserve to work one another with one another and respect one another. So that's why we will tell you about a gas hydrofracking bill, why you cannot trust your state legislators, can't trust your federal legislators, can't trust the major corporations, can't trust the lobbies, can't trust the consultants, can't trust the media, the official media, because they're all in the same loop of sharing the rewards of the person who has the power. So that's another part. And then we go to our commentary. Today, if time permits, and I'm not sure that it will, uh, depends upon how long my guest takes, uh, high Noon for the Imperium, American Empire in the Future, a very heady, very in-depth commentary from Professor Paul Atwood. I want people to think deeper on issues. I want them to see the full context of an argument, not little sound bites, not people jabbering between each other, but really undiluted information at a very intellectually challenging level. That's what we do every single day. And then we have our open segment of our program, which invites the public to call in and speak back on these issues. So you see, that's our program. Five segments every day, empowering to different groups of people. And let's begin. And I just gave that as background because of all the hundreds of thousands of new listeners of all ages. By the way, our latest profile off Google Analytics is, according to Myron, the largest single group of people tuning in, college-educated women between 35 and 45 years of age. Just to give you an idea of the demographics. Now, you can also listen to this program. I, my suggestion is get one of those um, phone services that allow you unlimited uh, listening because you've got to pay for 
phone call, but it's you can listen anywhere at 832-280-0066. 832-280-0066. That means you're no longer have to be in front of a radio. You can be anywhere in North America and listen anytime you want, just over the telephone. That's new technology. Let's begin. First on health and healing and things that we can all do, and I always gear the information to those who can least afford it. Therefore, no one is excluded from benefiting from it. Now, one of the least expensive vegetables is kale. It's because it's not a glamorous food. It's not in demand. It is easy to grow. It's grown from Maine down to Florida. But kale should be looked at a little differently. I love kale. I like to take kale, and what I do is I put it in a steamer for about six minutes, uh, just enough to break down some of the tough ligocellulose. Now, there's a reason why. If you're going to juice kale, that's good, but you'll get a tiny amount of juice because there's very little moisture in it. If you eat it raw, you're getting almost nothing from it because like broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, uh, Brussels sprouts, and kale, there's too much fiber. It's, it's a bound fiber. And that fiber called ligocellulose has the nutrients that you want inside of it. But once you juice it, it liberates it. That's why juicing is the number, way, number one way to get the maximum amount of nutrients into your body. Then steaming it lightly. Now, once you steam it lightly, then in temperature so low you could put your finger in, in the oil and not get it burnt, you use a coconut oil or a macadamia nut oil, which I really like because it imparts a wonderful nutty flavor to what you're cooking, and some lightly sauteed garlic, never to brown. If it's brown, throw it away. It's no good. Uh, but just so it's translucent, that's when the maximum sulfur is released, the sulfurophane, the healing ingredient in garlic that can heal ulcers and heal all forms of bacterial and viral conditions in your body. Then some cayenne. Now, cayenne comes from very mild cayenne that you wouldn't even know it's a red pepper to, uh, let's say, the Moroccan cayenne, which is extremely hot, to a Mexican cayenne, which is one of the hottest anywhere in the world. And they have heat units. And for most people, you want a moderate heat unit so it doesn't burn you. But it also helps your blood pressure, kills parasites, helps heal in the body. So you use that. And then you saute your kale in there, and then it's delicious. Now, why, why would you want kale? First, because according to the latest scientific research, kale is one of nature's most perfect uh, green, uh, leafy vegetables. It's anti-inflammatory. Now, since we know that the number one cause of almost 90% of illnesses, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, um, arthritis, dementia, Alzheimer's, is inflammation. So taking in things that turn off inflammation is just terrific for you. It's positively anti-inflammatory. Then it has good iron. Now for vegans like myself and many of you, you want to make sure you're getting a vegetable-based form of iron to prevent anemia. And iron deficiencies are on the rise. Well, per calorie, kale has more iron than beef. Then calcium. Now, we know that most people say, well, get your calcium from dairy. Yes, you can get calcium from dairy, but you're not getting boron. You're not getting manganese. You're not getting silica. So calcium in and of itself is not the answer. It's the combination of nutrients that comes with that, combined together. And here you're getting calcium and a lot of it. And um, in fact, kale contains more calcium per calorie than milk, 90 grams per serving. And it's also better absorbed by the body than dairy and no allergens. Then you're getting very good fiber. And like protein, fiber is a macronutrient. We need it every day. It can help prevent digestive disorders, including colorectal cancer. And you're getting in an average one serving of kale about, I would say, you're getting two grams of fi uh, protein, but about five grams of, about, no, 10, 10 grams of fiber, and that's good. Then you're getting the omega-3 fatty acids. You're getting about uh, 
120 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids uh, per serving. And then it helps you with immunity. There are super bugs and bacteria that can cause problems. And kale is a very rich source of the immune-stimulating flavonoids like vitamin A and C. And so those are the reasons to take kale. That's our nutrient of the day. Inexpensive, easy to get, buy it organic. And if for any reason you can't find it organic, then simply spray it with veggie wash and then thoroughly agitate it under water and you're getting 98, 99% of pesticides off. I'm always asked, if I don't have a lot of money and I want to do something to slow down the aging process, what nutrient can I purchase? Well, there's several. But the superstar nutrient that does more for anti-aging than any other that I know, and I was working with this nutrient years ago at the Institute of Applied Biology, is carnosine. Carno, C-A-R-N-O, seen, S-I-N-E. Carnosine is the number one way of slowing down glycation, slowing down oxidative stress, helping to protect against DNA damage from anything. And uh, as we grow older, the body uh, doesn't have enough carnosine to protect it. And in every laboratory study I've seen, Carnosine extends lifespan, and that can really add up if you're using two, 3,000 milligrams a day. Carnosine slows the aging process of human cells, and when you add carnosine to cultures of young cells, it extends the life. And while the control cells develop the typical old appearance, those grown in high carnosine concentrations retain the youthful appearance. And when these youthful appearing cells were transferred to culture dishes lacking extra carnosine, they quickly developed the old appearance of carnosine cells of the same age. And uh, so yet when scientists took old cells approaching the limits of their lifespan and transferred them into culture dishes containing high carnosine, they found that the cells rapidly became rejuvenated. And I did this when I took a thousand laboratory animals that I had borrowed that were going to be killed downstairs. I was on the third floor in the anti-aging lab that I had established. And downstairs is all orthodox, mainstream chemotherapy research. They were all looking for the patent to make them billionaires. And I was that kind of odd person upstairs doing this work that no one believed in called anti-aging. And when a rat is normally 12 months, it's at the end of its lifespan. It generally is very slow. You can't put it into almost any. If you put it on a treadmill, it'll go maybe a minute. Um, it can't swim. It uh, gets depressed. It'll attack other rats. Uh, it chews its tail. It's sad to see what happens in these circumstances. So I started with a group of near-death rats and gave them carnosine in their water and gave them juice and gave them revitalizing nutrients, including trimethylglycine, uh, dimethylglycine. In other words, I, I was experimenting to see what could I do to actually improve their life. And lo and behold, by the third or fourth uh, week, I was seeing improvement. Rats were losing weight. They had more energy. They were more socially interreactive, and uh, then I began to realize that they were actually rejuvenating. And when I tried to explain this to the scientists downstairs, they didn't believe it. They simply didn't believe it. So when I think back of how many experiments I did that today would be considered cutting edge, but at the time were simply thrown aside. In fact, I did 116 experiments that nobody would even send out the paper for publication, even though by today's standards they meet every criteria. And they were really revelatory. It was only when I finally discovered that all food had all eight essential amino acids that was a major breakthrough because every single scientific publication, every nutrition book, every dietitian manual in the world said that only animal proteins contain all eight essential amino acids, hence you must eat protein from animals fish, chicken, beef, eggs, dairy, three times a day. Hence the entire food pyramid, and hence people's food intake came from the idea that nothing other than an animal diet could supply us with the essentials. Men were the belief if you didn't have that meat, you'd get weak and puny. I found that was wrong. 
Do you know it took 12 years after I discovered that before a peer-reviewed journal would publish it? 12 years. So don't be mistaken that truth in our society will be welcomed by any official sources, especially if it challenges a hundred, two hundred billion dollar year animal industry, meat industry. In any case, carnitine, uh, carnosine was the key. Carnosine extends the lifespan of roidifers, a, a microscopic aquatic organism now being used as a model for aging in many laboratories. And in this experiment, scientists tested many different antioxidant compounds and identified carnosine as the one for just four that had significant effects on the uh, organism's longevity. It extended the lifespan by 20%. So what will it do? Let's summarize and take away some things from carnosine today. At 500 milligrams, let's say four times a day uh, for people over 30, for carnosine 1,000 milligrams four times a day for people over 50, Carnosine is a natural anti-aging constituent in your body. Carnosine fights age-induced processes of oxidation, glycation, and protein cross-linking. Mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, and a heavy metal accumulation. Carnosine levels decline with age. You're getting weaker and your immune system's weaker and you're going to speed up your aging. So carnosine can restore you full carnosine levels in your blood and tissue. In effect, it can extend your life. And that's based upon good quality science. The science is not in doubt. It can, remember, carnosine also protects your heart muscle from ischemic or a lack of blood flow, which can ultimately uh, produce a heart attack. And uh, carnosine actions on blood vessels can even prevent ischemia from occurring in the first place. It protects the artery lying endothelial cells from oxidation and glycation, both of which are early events in the development of atherosclerosis. So we have the science on our side. We have everything we need. It's just the average American doesn't know that the most single important nutrient that they should be taking, they're not. So I'm asking you, pay attention, take it, and live a longer, healthier life. I'm Gary Nall, back in a moment with my guests. Please stay with us. listening throughout the world, I welcome you. Now we go to our guest segment, but leading into our guest segment, I'm going to also share some insights from the environmental section because it's connected to what I'm going to be asking my guest, Professor Bill McGuire, Professor of Geophysical and Climate Hazards at University College in London, and regarded as the UK's leading volcanologist. And he is also a science writer, broadcaster, researcher, and he focuses on climate change forces and geological conditions and that produce hazardous uh, circumstances like earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes. And our question during this interview will be, looking at this little-known science on how climate change could trigger earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes. This is not being discussed at all in the United States. First, let me just say hello to... Uh, the professor who's in London. Nice to have you with us today, sir. Hello there. Thanks very much. Uh, coming to you in a second, I just wanted to give you a little information because I believe this connects to what you're going to discuss. I mentioned at the beginning that, and this is from Nation of Change, Ohio passes one of the worst fracking laws in the U.S. I'll quote this. It's just a, a paragraph long. It says, 
The Ohio State Assembly passed Senate Bill 315, one of the worst fracking laws in the nation, by 21 to 8 vote in the Senate and 73 to 19 in the House, that approves new regulations governing hydrologic fracking in uh, Etica and Marcellus Shale formations running underneath half of the state of Ohio. Uh, the shell gas provisions are part of a larger energy bill that also addresses Ohio's renewable energy portfolio. Now, here's what it does. The fracking companies can now hide all the chemicals they use in the fracking process by calling them trade secrets. Uh, what little they do disclose is 60 days after drilling takes place, which is too late for any community to test uh, the water. Then the gas industry pays absolutely nothing, not a penny, for the mess they create. The governor's minor tax on individual wells is offset by new tax breaks on property taxes and other giveaways, which means that this is an extremely messy process. If you've ever been around a gas hydrofracking, they use millions of gallons of water a day. They pump over 200 different chemicals, all of them toxic, into that well to break open, to fracture the shell, to release gas. But now the market for that gas is so low that it's costing more to actually frack than it is to sell. And we have a glut of that natural gas on the market. So the good news is I predicted a year and a half ago that the hydrofracking was a, a, it was not legitimate. We didn't need it. That this was a, this was a, a balloon that they were creating. It, it was it was to get a lot of investors in who had money, doctors, lawyers, engineers, professional class, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars each, thinking they were all going to be making a lot of money. They're going to lose all that. Next, no citizen notification or input will be allowed on any part of the fracking industry. There is no public notice, no public comment, no right to appeal for drill sites, pipelines, nothing. And if they get a, uh, if they own the mineral rights on your property which most of the time they do, the average citizen isn't even aware of that, they can put a, a drill right next door to your house. I mean, 10 feet away from your house. You have no control over where they put their uh, drilling rigs, the noise it makes, the pollution it causes, and you can't sue them. Now, what passes in Ohio will pass in many other states. Who's behind it? The fracking industry, the gas industry, and the, uh, the big lobbying groups. But the citizens knew none of this. All they know is what's coming at them. So now the question is, we are now fracking tens of thousands of wells per state. In fact, in New York State, they sought permission by our governor and our state legislator to frack 70,000 or 67,000 new wells in the state. That's just New York, that's just new wells. And we're fighting to keep that from happening by showing the truth behind hydrofracking. Now, if you're doing this all over the United States, the question then becomes, those wells that you dig, d uh, dig can they lead to earthquakes? What is the proof? We're going to be asking our guests in a second. The second issue is I've been suggesting that there are places in the United States, 16 states, that quite simply are running out of groundwater. The demands by industry and agriculture and citizens to use the water that's under there uh, is so great and there is no um, there's no honest discussion of what happens when a city runs out of water well think of if someone even approached that subject you would have people selling their houses uh, to get out uh, before the market collapse you'd have massive economic class and with that would go the taxes that the state gets from that that would go industry so instead of being honest about the consequences of environmental overuse, as if we have unlimited resources, we simply deny it and kick it down the road. Here's the latest on this. This is from Science Daily, one of the most respected scientific publications in the United States. And this is reported in the current issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That is our foremost number one scientific body in the United States. Quote, groundwater depletion 
in semi-arid regions of Texas and California threaten U.S. food security. The nation's food supply may be vulnerable to rapid groundwater depletion from irrigated agriculture, according to a new study. The study, which appears in the journal The Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, paints the highest resolution picture yet of how groundwater depletion varies across space and time in California's Central Valley, the High Plains, and of, and, and of the central United States. Researchers hope this information will enable more sustainable use of water in these areas, although they think irrigated agriculture may be unsustainable in some parts. Quote, we're already seeing changes in both areas, said the uh, leading scientist from the University of Texas at Austin. I have found that there's food, water rationing right now in 17 states. It is getting worse, not better. Now, the question I'm going to ask my guest in a second now is... If we're depleting all of our aquifers and we're not changing any of our habits and there is no national, local, or state campaign to let people know the truth about the water, can that lead to any other environmental catastrophes? That is the way we're leading in. Uh, sorry to have done that extended in introduction, but we have an environmental segment, so I combine that before yours because I think both of these you could address. So that said, I'm turning the forum over to you to share your insights into how we deal with the environment and how the environment then can trigger earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes. The forum is yours, sir. Thanks very much. Well, this, this whole idea of, of climate change interacting with a solid earth um, sounds a little bit mad, actually. But, but if you've seen the book, you'll know that it's rooted in, in hard science and that we've known for quite some time that when there are dramatic changes to the climate, um, we also see a response from the, the solid earth in, in the form of earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanic eruptions. And we, we see it particularly when we go back over the last 20,000 years, the time from the last ice age when we, the, the, much of the world was a frigid wasteland to the, to the present day when we're in a much warmer climate and that period saw massive changes at the loss of ice sheets three kilometers thick in polar regions 130 meter rise in sea levels and this re resulted in extraordinary changes in the stress and strain within the, the solid earth and we did see huge increases in, in geological activity so mad it sounds but it's something that as i said is rooted in hard science and we we understand very well the big question is when the climate continues to change going forward, are we going to see these sorts of responses again? And what are your thoughts? Well, I think one of the key points is that we're already seeing them to some extent. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that this idea wasn't known in the United States, but it, uh, there have been papers published by U.S. scientists, um, one of them working for NASA, that um, there's been an increase in earthquake activity in Alaska, uh, which is very nicely correlated with the, the loss of, of ice uh, overlying these faults that, that generate the earthquakes. In some cases, almost a kilometer of ice thickness has been lost over the last 100 years. Now, what seems to be happening here is what happened in, after the last ice ages in places like Scandinavia, where you had a huge ice sheet that melted, and that is that if you have faults sitting under thick layers of ice, those faults can't move very easily but they still accumulate strain. And so when that ice melts, that, uh, the force can move more easily, and all that strain is released, giving you an increase in earthquake activity. So we're seeing the first signs of how ice melting as a result of contemporary climate change caused by human activities is beginning to elicit a response from, from the solid earth. And it's in Alaska where we see this. Alaska, I think, is a bit like the canary in the coal mine. Because there's, it's a very tectonically active region, because there's lots of ice, um, I think that's where we're starting to see these first signs, which we may see in many other parts of the world as, as time goes by and as climate change starts to hit home even harder. When you, uh, thank you for that answer. When you look in the United States, uh, there is a service that I subscribe to that tells me each day, and I go up every day, how many volcanoes or how many have erupted, how many earthquakes have occurred everywhere in the world. And it shows you and what their magnitude is. And there are thousands per day. I wasn't aware of this. And, yeah. and, uh, but most of them are on, uh, no one notices them. They're either in uh, parts of the world in the ocean that no one pays attention to, or they're below what would be the you know the, the shaking sensation we're expecting. But then you start looking in in Arkansas, and Arkansas had more earthquakes last year than ever before in its recorded history, 
and some got up to 5.5. And then you look in Oklahoma, Oklahoma had more earthquakes, and both Arkansas and Oklahoma had something in common. Oklahoma is now one of the fastest growing areas for gas hydrofracking, as is Arkansas. So the question has to be raised, are these hydrofracking projects in the United States leading to a greater susceptibility within the Earth and its crust to cause an earthquake? Well, I mean, fracking, there is a relationship in fracking and climate change, which I'll come on to in a minute, but there is no doubt that if you pump pressurized water uh, fluids down into the crust, you can activate faults and you can trigger earthquakes. It's a, it's a well-known, established mechanism. Um, we have fracking in the UK now on a much smaller scale than in the US, and, uh, and there's no question of the sort of legislation you were talking about earlier being, being imposed here because people just wouldn't have it. But, you know, it's going on here. It's, there's been a big fuss because a couple of magnitude two earthquakes were triggered in, in one of the areas where this was happening. So... Um, you know, this is not a surprise. If you do this, you will trigger earthquakes. But uh, unless you're fracking in an area where there is a major fault which is ready to go and generate a big earthquake, you will not generate anything like magnitude, seven, magnitude 8, these really big, devastating quake events. Uh, you, should, you will get an increase in earthquake activity, but they should be magnitude 2, magnitude 3, maybe, as you say, up to magnitude 5 if there's a, a fault um, long enough that's ready to go. But I don't envisage, unless you, f you frack in a completely ridiculous situation like uh, you know, one of the what we call subduction zones where one plate is plunging down under another where you have these massive faults, unless you do it there, then I think you know, it, it should be relatively small magnitude events. All right. One other area. Um, we're witnessing violent cataclysmic events such as the Indian Ocean tsunami and volcanic a activity Right now in Italy, they just had two major events in the last week. And the Japanese mega tsunami that devastated Fukushima. And now if they get another even six point or higher, they're afraid that the very vulnerable Fukushima uh, plant, the uh, nuclear plant, the building number uh, four, will collapse. And if that does, it will release a cataclysmic event because stored fuel rods, 1,341 stored fuel rods are in that building, plus there are 7,000 more in that immediate area. So it's really bad. All based upon, can they get those fuel rods out into safe storage before there's another earthquake? Now, when you look around that whole rim, do you see the potential to have some cataclysmic earthquakes, including those that have not yet hit from uh, on our side. They've hit in South America and Chile. They hit in Australia and Queensland. They hit in Japan. Uh, they hit in the Philippines. But they haven't hit from Alaska down to the bayou. Do you see that as a possibility in the near future, a big one? Well, it's been an extraordinary time uh, the last decade for extremely large earthquakes. Now, there have actually been three magnitude 8.8 .8 and above quakes since uh, the Indian Ocean event in 2004. Now, that's extraordinary because these things normally happen maybe once every 50 years or so. We've seen three of them in seven years. Now, nobody knows why that is. It could be statistical. It could be pure chance. Um, it's almost certainly, in this case, nothing to do with climate change because uh, at the moment we've got rising sea levels and the extra load of, of the sea on these submarine faults that have generated the tsunamis would actually act to stabilize them. So climate change probably hasn't a role to play here. Um, it may be, and it has been suggested by, by at least one seismologist, that the huge earthquake in the Indian Ocean in 2004 may have shaken up some other force, even half a world away, that were ready to go. In other words, one in Chile that went and generated an 8.8 .8 in 2010 and the big Japanese event last year. Um, but that is pure speculation. There's no hard scientific evidence for that at the moment. But to be honest, that we, we don't know why we have this cluster. But of course, in the west coast of the United States, the really big worry is, is a structure called the Cascadia Subduction Zone, which runs all the way from um, uh, southern Canada, British Columbia, off the west coast, right the way down to northern California, where it joins up with San Andreas. And that is a, is a huge fault. It's over 1,000 kilometers long. It last ruptured in, in 1700, generating a massive tsunami, a magnitude 9 earthquake, similar to the Indian Ocean event. And that is 
that's not imminently going to rupture, but it is, um, it is a fall which is ready to go probably sometime in the next 50 to 100 years. So, you know, that, that is certainly a worry, and I think most major communities down the West Coast are very, very aware of this, and they're certainly very aware of the potential tsunami threat. Well, I appreciate the insights you've given us and uh, that there is a connection. We have to pay attention. We should be doing all we can uh, just to prepare for such events. I, we're not In the United States, we're not ready for discomforting ourselves. Now, one last question for you. Is it true or not true that there are parts of England, the United Kingdom specifically, that are now underwater in the last 15 years that no one thought would be underwater, but some scientists predicted it would be underwater, and no one took the precautions, and now roads and some villages no longer are habitable because no one uh, counted upon the rising tides in the ocean taking back some of the land. Is that true or not true? I, I haven't heard of that, I must admit. I'm not sure where that comes from. I mean, there are, you know, if you go to particularly to southwest England, the places where there's a lot of erosion on the coastline, um, there are traces of abandoned villages there, but those have been abandoned over 100 years ago. I mean, sea levels are rising in the UK as they are everywhere else, by, um, at the moment only by about uh, less than half a centimetre a year, but, but accelerating as the, as the big polar ice sheets melt. So you know, okay. I'm not sure where that comes from. But right. as, so, as far as I know, all our villages and, the, and their, their inhabitants good. are still safe. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. My final question is, are there parts of England that are now running low on water where you're in water rationing and do not have enough uh, refill water into the aquifers to accommodate all the needs? Yes, we have a big problem, particularly in, in southern England here, with, with uh, water because we've had a very dry couple of years. Um, <clears throat> this is a trend that's going to continue, obviously predicted to continue with, with uh, climate change. And uh, m- uh, many parts of, of uh, the southern UK have been under drought order. In other words, people haven't been able to wash their cars, haven't been able to use hose pipes in the garden, these sorts of things. Um, we, we've been the situation a little bit better because April was the wettest April on record, which has, has uh, helped things a little bit. But nevertheless, groundwater resources are are suffering in, in southern UK, um, as they are in many countries. You mentioned the US earlier on. It, water is is going to be the new oil, clearly of the, of the future. And I think the the UN identifies 158 flashpoints around the world where wars could be fought over water. So groundwater resources are going to be a huge issue. We need something like 50% or 30% rather more water by 2030 um, to supply the global population. Well, I don't think we're going to get that. So you know, it's a problem here in the southern UK. It's a problem in the US. And it, it's a problem right across the planet. Well, if people take the opportunity to read your book, Waking the Giant, How a Changing Climate Triggers Earthquakes, Tsunamis, and Volcanoes, it is such an education. It is, is a valuable asset, and I thank you very much for t- taking the time and the scholarship to prepare this for us, and uh, we wish you all the best with it. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Professor Bill McGuire, M-C-G-U-I-R-E, and I'm Gary Nall. Now, uh, we're not going to have time to get to everything, but I did want to get into a commentary and then allow you an opportunity, and Luan Panessi, who's standing by with some of your questions, an opportunity to share some insights. However, two things that I predicted I wanted just to share with you. Remember I said that be very aware that I believe, it's my belief, based upon watching everything going on, that uh, Greece would fall um, as far as failing to uh, support the, the, um, the gross uh, structural adjustment in their country, meaning taking away their pensions. And that would happen in June, June 15th. They would vote out the old regime, vote in new, they would withdraw that. I'm predicting that Spain will follow, Portugal follow Spain, Ireland follow Portugal, and Italy follow all of them, and that will be the end of the euro uh, zone as we know it in the euro. The dollar will become temporarily worth a little more because they're going to flee into the dollar, but that's only temporary. Why? Because behind all this are two things waiting. One, I think the most irresponsible government in imaginable is in uh, Israel right now, Netanyahu, but he has 85% control over the Knesset. Therefore, I believe it's not, is he going to attack, but when? Probably right after the election, and based upon a new treaty uh, that we have just passed, new set of laws, I should say, we just passed, we have to protect them, go to bat for them, uh, arm them completely, which means we're going to be in that war too. What do you think China's going to do? 
China is going to support Iran. Russia and India will support Iran. Brazil will support Iran. What do you think that's going to do to the cost of oil? Overnight, oil will go to $300 a barrel. Gas will go to $17 a gallon. But more importantly, Japan has been unloading hundreds of billions of dollars of the money in the form of T-bills, treasury notes, in building phantom cities, buying up mass amounts of land. And so it's still holding some. By that time, it can say goodbye to the dollar. The moment China says it's not going to accept the dollar as a reserve currency, but instead accept a mixed currency, your dollar bill will be worth about 50% less than what it is. You will have hyperinflation, so it's going to cost you a massive amount to buy anything, and the value of what you pay, uh, pay to buy that is going to be worth less. Here's the latest on this. This just came out this morning. This is from Press TV. Quote, Japan and China start direct yen yuan trading. China and Japan plan to launch direct currency trading as of June 1st to get rid of the dollar as the inter- intermediary unit and facilitate trade and financial transactions between the two Asian economic giants. Quote, from June 1, the yen yuan exchange rate will be constantly indicated in both markets facilitating full-fledged direct exchange trading, said Japan's finance minister, uh, Azumi, uh, yesterday. The move is a part of an agreement between the two countries to promote direct trading. And by the way, it's not just that. It's the, there are 28 countries in Central and South America that are going to trade in their own currencies by passing the dollar. And uh, there's the BRIC nations, including Brazil, Russia, China, India, and South Africa, going to do the same. So my conclusion, we will no longer have the dollar as a reserve currency. And when that, that will give China the excuse it needs to say goodbye to that when Israel and stupidly goes after Iran, we will see all the economies that we are now in change dramatically the day after that happens. Hopefully, you won't have any debt at that point. Now, for those of you who appreciate, um, I'm going to start this in this hour. We'll run right up to the end of the hour, so all stations carrying us only for 55 minutes. Uh, you can continue listening over the telephone by calling 832-280-0066, 832-280-0066, or go to progressiveradionetwork.com or garyandall.com to hear the rest of this. But first, we're going to say hello to Luann Panessi. Then I'm going to play you. This is for Sean Hannity. Sean, for you, uh, for um, for Laura Schlesinger, for Bill O'Reilly, I have a gift for you today. And it's coming at you, courtesy of George Carlin, in just a moment. But first, let's say hello to Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hi, Gary. <laughs> Boy, you, you, you'll never hear what just what we just heard anywhere else on the news about the dangers of hydrofracking and, and the water shortages. It's, it's scary, but it's good to know. <clears throat> and your audience is way ahead of the curve. I have one quick letter to read. I know you, you're, you're tight on time. But I thought this was interesting. It's from Lori, and she's from Hamburg, Germany. And uh, she used to live in China. She says, I've been listening to Gary Null since arriving in China nearly two years ago. I can attest that listening to him with consistency and gleaning from his commentaries, his views on health, government, and the media, big pharma, and so on, I found myself agreeing with him more often than not. I first heard him on WBAI, but eventually switched over to PRN, whose programs are superior to BAI's, given its wide range of topics. I now listen to Richard Martin, Steve Lendman, whose program I particularly like, and Michael Rupert. And she said, my husband, now a convert, who listens to Gary's shows as well, and I are grateful for your guidance and your information. And um, now they're going to be traveling to Hamburg, Germany, and... She's going to continue listening to PRN right through the Internet. So I thought that was a nice shout-out from, uh, from overseas to know that people are listening in and they're appreciating all of your information. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, by the way, tomorrow I'm going to talk about Turn Out the Lights. The largest U.S. cities are becoming cesspools of filth, decay, and wretchedness, according to uh, the, the peer review uh, economic collapse. So this is, this is a look at what we predicted over two years ago on a program, a one-hour program. What's going to happen? And remember when I said we don't have an economy? 
we have yeah. eight eight different economies and yeah. depending upon which of those eight if you're the super super rich if you're just the rich if you're the upper middle class if you're the professional class if you're the uh, middle class if you're the working middle class if you're the poor uh, each and every one of those you're going to be affected differently and 257 million Americans are just above at or below the poverty level so there's nothing but a beat, ba- beat down coming to them nothing at all in our political or social system is going to help them protect them or look after their interest and I said you're going to see it if you live in a gated area you won't see it if you live in certain areas you'll have to have a card to get in to identify that you're okay to be there either work there or live there but everywhere else in America it's going to look like Mad Maxville And I said, you're going to see where the service won't be the same. So potholes won't be fixed. And you'll see garbage not picked up. Well, now it's happening. As we speak, it's happening. It's not the future. It's now. So I'm going to go into this tomorrow on our program. Now, for all of those who uh, think that um, what we've had in the past politically, and they keep hearing about their great hero, the uh, moral majority, and Ronald Reagan, just the best. I mean, how could we have not lived more closely to their ideals? Well, George has a few thoughts on that. I really haven't seen this many people in one place since they took the group photographs of all the criminals and lawbreakers in the Ronald Reagan administration. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 225 of them so far. 225 different people in the Ronald Reagan administration have either quit, been fired, been arrested, indicted, or convicted of either breaking the law or violating the ethics code. 225 of them. And Edwin Meese alone, (laughs) Edwin Meese alone has been investigated by three separate special prosecutors, and there's a fourth one waiting for him in Washington right now. Three separate special prosecutors have had to look into the activities of the Attorney General. And the Attorney General is the nation's leading law enforcement officer. (laughs) See, that's what you gotta remember. This is the Ronald Reagan administration we're talking about. These are the law and order people. These are the people who are against street crime. They wanna put street criminals in jail to make life safer for the business criminals. (laughs) They're against street crime. Yeah, they're against street crime, providing that street is in Wall Street. (laughs) And the Supreme Court decided about a year ago that it's all right to put people in jail now if we just think they're going to commit a crime. It's called preventive detention. All you got to do now is just think they're going to commit a crime. Well, if we'd have known this seven or eight years ago, we could have put a bunch of these Republican (laughs) directly into prison. Put them in the joint where they belong and we could have saved the money of putting these country club pinheaded on trial. Another thing you gotta remember, this is the group of people who were elected with the help of the moral majority. Elected with the help of the moral majority and the Teamsters Union. That's a good combination. Organized religion and organized crime working together to help build a better America. Another thing. Keep in mind, these Reagan people are the ones that were going to get government off our backs. Remember that? That was the rhetoric of the 1980 campaign. We'll get government off your backs and out of your lives. Yeah, but they still want to tell you what magazines you can read, and they still want to tell you what rock lyrics you can listen to, and they still want to force your kids to pray in school, and they still want to tell you what you can say on the radio. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, decided all by itself that radio and television were the only two parts of American life not protected by the free speech provisions of the First Amendment to the Constitution. I'd like to repeat that because it sounds vaguely important. (laughs) The FCC, an appointed body, not elected, answerable only to the president, decided on its own that Radio and television were the only two parts of American life not protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And why did they decide that? Because they got a letter from a minister in Mississippi. (laughs) A Reverend Donald Wildman in Mississippi heard something on the radio that he didn't like. Well, Reverend, did anyone ever tell you there are two knobs on the radio?
course, I'm sure the Reverend isn't that comfortable with anything that has two knobs on it. <laughs> but hey, Reverend, there are two knobs on the radio. One of them turns the radio off, and the other one changes the station. <laughs> Imagine that, Reverend, you can actually change the station. It's called freedom of choice, and it's one of the principles this country was founded upon. Look it up in the library, Reverend, if you have any of them left when you finish burning all the books. <laughs> Now, I don't know how you feel, but I have personally just about had it with these church people. <laughs> just about had it. Yeah. You know what I say we should do with these churches? Tax them. <laughs> Tax these <laughs> If they're so interested in politics and government and public policy, let them pay their admission price like everybody else. You know what I mean? Tax them. Hey, the Catholic Church alone could wipe out the federal budget deficit if all you did was tax them on their real estate holdings. And speaking of real estate holdings, let's get back to Ronald Reagan and his criminal gang. When last we left them, they were going to get government off our backs. Yeah, but when it comes to abortion, they don't mind government being in a woman's uterus, do they? Yeah, backs are no good, but uterus is okay by them. These people call themselves right to lifers. Don't you love that phrase? And don't you love the way these kind of people pervert the English language, right to lifers? You realize that most of the right to lifers are in favor of the death penalty? And they support the South American death squads? And they're against gun control? And they're against nuclear weapons control? When they say right to life, they're talking about their right to decide which people should live or die. So these right wingers... You know? So these Reagan people, these right-wingers in general, these uh, crypto-fascists, they're against homosexuality. They're against pornography. They're against sex education. They're against abortion. Yeah, they're gonna get government off your back, but they're gonna tell you how to live your sex life. And let me ask you this, how would they know anything about it? <laughs> Have you ever taken a look at those people? No wonder they're afraid of their bodies. Take a look at them. Doesn't it strike you as mildly ironic that most of the people who are against abortion are people you wouldn't want to f in the first place? Does that strike you a little strange? Well, hey, I'm the first one to say it's a great country, but it's a strange culture. We got a strange culture. This has got to be the only country in the world that could ever come up with a disease like bulimia. <laughs> got to be the only country in the world where some people have no food at all and other people eat a nourishing meal and puke it up intentionally. <laughs> this is a country where tobacco kills 400,000 people a year, so they ban artificial sweeteners. <laughs> because a rat died. You know what I mean? This is a place where gun store owners are given a list of stolen credit cards, but not a list of criminals and maniacs. <laughs> and now they're thinking about banning toy guns, and they're gonna keep the real ones! <laughs> This is a place where alcohol ruins more lives than cancer, and everybody gets upset when some athlete gets hooked on cocaine. You know, Time Magazine and Newsweek, they put cocaine on the cover, but they put the liquor advertisements inside the magazine. It's the old American double standard. You know, say one thing, do something different. And of course, the country is founded on the double standard. That's our history. We were founded on a very basic double standard. This country was founded by slave owners who wanted to be free. <laughs> Am I right? A group of slave owners who wanted to be free. 
So they killed a lot of white English people in order to continue owning their black African people so they could wipe out the rest of the red Indian people and move west and steal the rest of the land from the brown Mexican people, giving them a place to take off and drop their nuclear weapons on the yellow Japanese people. You know what the motto... You know what the motto of this country ought to be? You give us a color, we'll wipe it out. We got it. So anyway, about 80 years after the Constitution is ratified, 80 years later, the slaves are freed. Not so you'd really notice it, of course. <laughs> Just sort of on paper. And that was, of course, during the Civil War. Now, there's another phrase I dearly love. That is a true oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Civil War. Do you think any country could really have a civil war? <laughs> Say, pardon me. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry. I'm awfully sorry. So. Now, of course, the Civil War has been over for about 120 years, but not so you'd really notice it. <laughs> because we still have these people called Civil War buffs. People who thought it was a really keen war. And they study the battles carefully and they try to improve on the strategies and the tactics to increase the body count in case we have to go through it again sometime. In fact, some of these people actually get dressed up in uniform once a year and go out and refight these battles. You know what I say? Use live ammunition, would you please? You might just raise the intelligence level of the American gene pool. But what do you expect? Hey, come on, this is a warlike country. We come from that Northern European, basically the Northern European genes, the blue eyes, those blue eyes. Boy, everybody in the world learned real quick, didn't they? When those blue eyes sail out of the North, you better nail everything down. <laughs> nail it down, strap it down, or they'll grab it. If they can't take it home, they'll burn it. If they can't burn it, they'll <laughs> it. That's what happened to us. And it's a warlike country, come on. I mean, forget foreign policy. Even the domestic rhetoric is warlike. Everything about our domestic policy invokes the thought of war. We don't like something in this country, we declare war on it. The war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on crime, the war on AIDS, the war on cancer. We got the only national anthem that mentions rockets and bombs in the god thing, you know what I mean? All right. And that's just a little gift to the people over at Fox. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day. This is PRN.FM. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. Hi, this is Mike Rupert, host of the Lifeboat Hour, the number one show on Progressive Radio Network right behind our founder, Gary Null. Join us every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern for a soulful gut check on the status of our troubled planet and what you can do to try and adapt to it. This is from a nightclub at the end of the world. In the midst of heavy discussion, we also bring you a special and unique musical message from my band, New White Trash, and other very special artists. You can find all of our shows in the PRN archives for convenient listening at prn.fm. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. Hi, it's me, John Mueller, host of The Expat Files, broadcasting twice a week from somewhere deep down in the heart of Latin America. The Expat Files is a show that explains what it's really like to live, work, play, and or retire down here in Latin America. You can catch The Expat Files on Mondays and Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and of course, in the archives. And don't forget, we'd like you to rate the show in iTunes. So, whether you're interested in jumping off the first world treadmill or are just curious about Latin America, take it from me, a guy who's been down here 20 plus years. The Expat Files is tailor-made for you. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. You are listening to PRN.FM, the Progressive Radio Network. Network. You want answers? You want answers! I want the truth! The truth! Lies! Lies! You're telling me that you'll be true! It's not...
not even close to public service. It's public delusion. It's always the underclass that gets hit. It's all been about privatizing and profit. There's no pushback from Congress. All they're trying to do is exploit the system, hold the system hostage. Has everyone gone that way? Houston, we have a problem. And now, live from the Progressive Radio Network, The Solution Zone, with Christiane Brown. And welcome to The Solution Zone on the Progressive Radio Network. I'm Christiane Brown, and as we enter yet another frenzied and obscenely expensive presidential and congressional election cycle... Americans, once again, are going to march out the door. We're going to head to the polls, and we're going to willfully ignore the evidence well documented by my first guest that voting in the United States has become a pantomime for the real thing and exercise that uh, really allows us as citizens to participate only in the illusion of democracy but doesn't give us any power to sway the ultimate outcome of the elections we participate in. Greg Pallast is my first guest this half hour. He'll be joining me to discuss his upcoming book, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, How the Election Games Are Fixed by the Coke Gang, Carl Rove, and Their Buck Buddies. And coming up in the second half of the program, if someone told the booming American middle class is 30 years ago, that by the year 2012, the middle class as they know it would be almost destroyed, that a corporate feudalist government would uh, hold the reins of power, and that Americans would be convinced to allow this to happen by doing it to themselves. Uh, You know, they'd say, what are you smoking? But uh, we look around today, and that is exactly what happened. How methodical was this plan to eliminate the middle class? Who was behind it, and how exactly did it unfold in his new book? 15 Steps to Corporate Feudalism, How the Rich Convinced America's Middle Class to Eliminate Themselves. I'll be welcoming Dennis Marker to the program. He'll lay out 15 systematic steps that worked in conjunction over the past to bring the middle class to the dismal point that it is right now. But uh, let's begin with this year's election. Pleased once again to welcome Greg Pallas back to the Solution Zone. Greg, how you doing? Hey, how you doing, Chris? John, I've got a... Um... Yeah, what? So you really want to know what I'm smoking? Uh, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've got Somebody's got to be smoking something if we buy the fact that our elections are uh, legit here in America. Yeah, but, you know, but they stole the election already for 2012, but we can steal it back. That's, okay. That's the, that's, the, that's the whole point. We can steal it back. We're not helpless. You know, um, we, we have a chance. Uh, America... Uh, you know, we've always had we've had plenty of populist the movements from uh, from the uh, uh, you know the Sons of Liberty to the Civil Rights Movement and in between, and so we can we can overcome the billionaire ballot bandits, and that's uh, so billionaires and ballot bandits is the title of uh, the new book. What it is is, you know, for those who know me, I tend to I've spent years working on two things. Uh, uh, number one is uh, how they've shoplifted our elections uh, over the years uh, in America, and the other for BBC Television, The Guardian, and then also for. Uh, but my main issue has been class war, you know, them and us. And my last book, Vultures Picnic, or about all the billionaires seizing America. My new book coming out in uh, actually beginning of September, but we're putting it together now, and I'm trying to enlist people in. in in getting involved, it's kind of of a of a we do it together project. Is uh, billionaires and ballot bandits election games 2012, where we're going to take the information about how they're going to steal the vote. When I say we, 